So what I'm going to try to talk about uh, work I've done in structural biology and how, the role that dynamics plays in this because I think for the future and where NSLS2, BNL, will be transformative is in actually enabling a dynamic view of biology in action. So you're going to hear quite a lot of things um, I've done over the last um, decade or, or so, I think. Um, I realized as I was walking up, I am assuming everybody knows where a life source is, or has the vaguest idea of it. That may or may not be true. You can sing out or let me know where I've gone wrong in the end. So, we're going to say a little, tell you a little bit about me, something about structural biology. I'm going to talk more scientifically about DNA repair and some of the, the work and some of the insight I think my group got whilst we were doing um, the science I'm going to describe to you and then a little bit about NSLS2 and what NSLS2 might be able to do. And I'm going to try to do this all in the context of biological structure, of the atoms, of the movement and of the, um, the interactions they undergo in, in doing their function. So, me. I come from somewhere near Liverpool. Liverpool in the UK. The UK is a small island dangling off the edge of Europe nowadays. <laughs> yeah. I'd laugh if it wasn't such a tragedy. Um, this is actually the street I grew up on early on, more or less when I was there. Um, it was an industrial town. More importantly, and I have to move around, I sort of, that thing makes me stand in one place and I don't like it. So, for the last 20 odd years I've been working in Grenoble in one of two capacities at the European Synchrotron, which um, I think my team helped turn into the best light source for structural biology in Europe and arguably in the world. I'm here to try to help that happen for NSLS2. Um, we were building structural biology beamlines and then the structural biology group, structural biology research program. Some things worked better than others and that's probably going to be visible in the, some of the prejudices you'll hear as I talk about what we're doing. Um, the SRF is somewhat different to NSLS2, somewhat similar. It's also the environment is different. So you can see the light source is circular. It's actually about the same size as NSLS2. It's built in the mountains. There are two rivers nearby, which didn't make for the best floor to begin with. I used to live just about there where the dot is at the foot of this mountain, Luneron about five, 10 minutes drive away or 15 minutes on my bike. I am paying with my waistline for not being able to ride my bike as much as I would like. Um, and everything I'm going to talk to you about today was undertaken on the campus in Grenoble and using primarily the SRF as the light source. So, structural biology. What is it and why on earth should anybody care? Well, the primary thing about structural biology is it is a way, perhaps the way, to understand the mechanisms of biological function in action. And we can do this from the tools that we've been able to develop from an atomic point of view, so we can understand the chemistry of what's happening in these processes through to the larger scale organization so that we can place biological molecules in their um, cellular context. We can do that using an exquisite set of tools that have been developed to enable us to manipulate these molecules so we can understand in very high levels of detail which parts of the molecules are important and why, which are not, how these molecules relate to similar molecules in other organisms, where there are there important differences, where there are significant similarities. This spans a... a, a research from basic fundamental science through to health-related science to the development of new drugs and generating, in some cases, billions of dollars. And lots of this is through to structural biology. Now, structural biology is complex and also, in a way, simple. So what I'm showing you here is a simplified view of hemoglobin, the molecule that carries oxygen around in our blood, and 
The dynamics are for our two states, and what you really need to look at is the, the green blobs, which is oxygen, and the transitions between states are caused by the, that binding, and that binding has the effect of making it easier to add oxygen to partner molecules within the overall complex so that you can carry more oxygen around your body and so you can um, get, release oxygen as necessary quickly. We understand the structures, we understand the dynamics, we understand better biological function. We can translate this to other um, organisms, other methods. Now, light sources have been enormously important to the development of structural biology. It goes without a shadow of a doubt. So the graph on the right, going astronomically up, is a year-on-year -year tally of the number of structures that are made publicly available. The PDB, the Protein Data Bank, was developed here at Brookhaven Lab. It's now elsewhere, but we owe a debt of gratitude to the folks who set that up. Structural biology has been one of the pioneers of making data available to the public for critical analysis and for understanding and to make it freely available. The numbers are quite staggering, though. Off my graph, if you go back to the early 90s, tens of structures per year were being produced. Within a decade, that was up towards thousands. You know, we're up to 10,000 a year now. Light sources and what we've been able to do at light sources have enabled this because the green line shows you the important role. So these are all the structures that are available where the data were collected at light sources. 90% year on year for the past 20 years, which is a price paid with a lot of sweat, blood, and dollars, or euros, pounds, whichever, in order to actually provide the, the instrumentation for that. I'm not going to talk a lot about instrumentation. I'm going to try to talk about science and, and some ideas. But, you know, this is an enormous reflection on the cooperation that generally existed amongst the different um, groups studying this. So, structural biology. The idea we're trying to get to is that we can look at a molecule and understand it. The molecules is made up of atoms. These things are tiny. So the best way of thinking about this in the end I had was an old diagram of an analogy to a microscope. A microscope, if you project visible light onto an object with a series of lens, you can collect the light that's scattered and through the computer computational processes in your eye, you can generate an enlarged image of the object you're illuminating. The way to think about the structural biology I'm going to talk to you about is similar, but also entirely different. In that we have an object, a crystal. A crystal is just a collection of the protein molecules we're interested in, somehow arranged together so that they have three-dimensional order. Now, often when you think about crystals, you think about something hard like a diamond or a jewel. Our crystals are more like a pile of... Um, Jello, is that the American word? Sorry, I don't speak American yet. Um, you'll see. <laughs> so, they're very unstable. They wobble about. They're not fixed in, as, as fixed in space as we would like. Anyway, if you illuminate them with x-rays, something happens. That What happens, we can detect. It's called a diffraction pattern. And if we then do the reconstruction with a computer, what we can do is create an image of the things that interacted with those x-rays. And the things that interacted with those x-rays are the electrons around the atoms. And if we look at that and use our imagination and our knowledge, we can build a model which then gives us the structure. The thing that generates the vast majority of structures that are used in the world today is x-ray crystallography. The reason we need a light source is because the light source generates X-rays, and the reason why NSLS2 has the opportunity to be the best available for structural biology is it's going to produce the best and brightest beams of X-rays in the future. And bringing all of this together will be the task of the structural biology team over the next number of years. 
The easier thing sometimes is to recognize the there is an opportunity. The hard thing is to actually seize that opportunity and make something of it. And this is the challenge we face over the next two or three years is actually to take this in place. Now, don't worry, this is, all you have to remember is that when the x-rays interact with our crystal, we get something we can measure with an intensity and it has these HKLs. The HKLs is a sort of a zip code for them. Through various maths, we can um, reconstruct the electron density. It's all understood, it's all programmatically fine. And in fact, methods that have been developed at light sources have made it an awful lot easier to do this reconstruction from a pattern we measure through to a, a structure itself. And in good cases, this can be completely automated. So, a walkthrough of a structural biology project in its lifetime. First off, find something interesting. So, here's an example of something that some of you collected data on today, I think, lysozyme. Lysozyme is interesting because it has antibacterial properties, and way back in the 20s, people were worrying about how to deal with infection, and lysozyme was something that was of interest. It was actually um, named by Alexander Fleming, who was the discoverer of penicillin and um, went on to get the Nobel Prize for it. So we're interested in the structure of lysozyme and we have a clue that you can, there's quite a lot of it in uh, egg white. Now we need to generate enough of it so we can produce a crystal. So the way this works, and this is close to how it works nowadays as well, is first off you need a lot of sources for this protein. Yeah, a lot of eggs. Or you need to produce, induce something which can produce a lot of this material that you're interested in. Or better still, you need a lot of these things to produce a lot of the substance you're interested in so you can purify it. Now, today we would do this using bacteria, using E. coli in most cases, in many cases using tools that were developed here at Brookhaven itself. This gives us a way of producing large amounts of protein. If we're very lucky, we can then produce crystals. And crystals will come in all shapes and sizes. Different colors as well, depending on what's in them. These are ranges of experiments showing you all the different types of um, crystal we might get. The catalog shows you that when you've had a success. We still have no idea at the start how to produce crystals for a completely new protein. There's a lot of trial and error involved still. If we illuminate one of these crystals with x-rays, we'll get one of these patterns I was referring to. This is a lovely one. Through the run, to, run through, the committee asked me, so why is this lovely? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? You know, that's, that's my view as a crystallographer, having seen thousands of these, but I accept it's perhaps not so obvious to everybody. So one of the important things, the spots are round. Round spots tell you an awful lot about how good your crystal is, amazingly enough. They're strong, i.e. you can see them. There is actually generally a lot of data that you don't actually see with your eyes because the data is, your eye is not good enough to get it, and they're separated. So if you've got round spots that you can see that are separated, you're gonna be able to fix them, you're gonna be able to give each one of these intensities its zip code, you're gonna be able to understand where it is and how it relates to everything else, and you're good to go. Except it's not quite that simple. In reality, what we have is a stationary beam, and we rotate the crystal a little bit. We rotate the crystal a little bit to enable new spots to be seen. The new spots pass through this pattern as I'm talking, and our task is to measure each of these reflections and to see them in terms of the angle in which they were recorded. Way back, before I really started, this was photographic film we'd collect all the images on. It was hellish. It really was awful. If you ever tried developing x-ray film in the middle of the night after no sleep for several days, you know where one of the circles of hell is going to do for you. Now, we have detectors which are so fast, we essentially rotate the crystal, the, the, the electronic detector can read out fast enough, and data, data collections which may have taken days in the past are condensed down to seconds now. Technology has played an important part in structural biology. But why is structure interesting or useful? 
So antibiotics, this is penicillin. This is actually a model generated by a crystallographer, Dorothy Hodgkin, in 1945 of penicillin. This model came about at a time when, due to the pressures of the Second World War, there was an enormous effort to try to produce lots of penicillin to save lives. Penicillin has been one of the most transformative drugs that have been produced in the last hundred years. It's revolutionized almost every aspect of medical health care. Nobody knew the structure of this, but more importantly, didn't know what the chemical formula was of something they were trying to synthesize. It was only after the structure, through pioneering work by Dorothy Hodgkin and her co-workers, revealed the structure that they started to get a feel for how important the molecule was and start to understand where the chemical constraints might be which allow it to be accurate. So, structure at many levels can be extremely impo important and informative. It looks lovely when you see the bonds are nice and rigid, the atoms are all in one place, everything is well located. The, the reality is messier because in collecting our data, we cool the proteins to minus 180 Celsius. I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit, I'm sorry. Um, and we trap many states. So what we're actually seeing in our, in our structures are ensembles of states. And those on, ensembles of states, I would contend, often have biological function. And one of the important tasks for the future is to understand biological function better by understanding the dynamics of, of proteins in action. And I think and perhaps one of the single most important things that NSLS2 could do is push forward into a new field and to a new level, structural biology. I'm paid to say it in a way, but structural biology is so important it can't just be left to chance. Now you're all thinking, Bleh. He's talking rubbish, you know? And perhaps, perhaps to a certain degree, no, I would never accept it. I think it is that important, and it's important we do it well. Um, but, so, normally, last time I was in here, I was listening to a Nobel Prize winner talk about structural biology. Yeah. Today, you're going to hear about what a plodder can then um, achieve if he keeps plodding. My one talent in, in the SRF was perhaps to actually find and get working with me a group of extremely talented people. So all of the work you're going to see has been done by people who are really much brighter than me. This is DNA. Yeah, and DNA is one of these ubiquitous molecules nowadays that we hear about all of the time. It encodes most of what everything that goes on within our cells and within all living organisms. It encodes how they can encode themselves and make themselves. It's an enormously complicated process. People wouldn't be getting Nobel Prizes if there wasn't some interest in this sort of stuff. But what happens when errors happen? If you want to make the same protein, you have to have an absolute identical copy over and over. Our cells are turning this process over many thousands of times a day. If you walk out into the sunlight or spend too much time on the beach, there's a chance that the UV radiation will cause some damage. What happens? So that was a question we were interested in. And we were interested in particular in this organism here, which is a bacteria called Deinococcus radiodurans. You don't have to really worry about the name. It, it's pink, it is pink, and it generally forms these sort of tetrads, um, which may or may not be of significance. The most important and interesting thing to us was this measurement, which is a fairly crummy graph for you, the resolution's not very good, but you can see the point. Humans, the ubiquitous cockroaches, the bacteria, E. coli, are all killed off at relatively small doses of ionizing radiation. This thing carries on living. You can't kill it below six or seven kilograms of radiation, which is an enormous amount. 
So we like to think of bacteria as being simple. How could something so simple survive an assault like this when more complicated and better evolved species are killed off? This is a sort of interesting fundamental question because what happens to the genomic DNA with this sort of irradiation is the thing is that the DNA is fragmented enormously. There are double strand breaks, there are single strand breaks, it's in pieces. Yet somehow this organism is able to withstand the irradiation, is able to find the DNA and is able to rebuild its genome so it can carry on replicating. We did measurements where this thing carries on replicating whilst we were irradiating it with high radiation doses. And that's the fundamental question we set out to try to understand. And we try to understand it through looking at some of the DNA repair mechanisms. Now, there are several different types of things that can happen when your DNA is um, shocked with different types of um, challenges. Um, we tried to look at all three of these different types of pathways from base modifications, so a single part of your DNA is changed in some way, to bulky lesions where there's something gross induced within the, the DNA itself, to cleavages. And these three different types of pathways are areas where we tried to understand both the structure and the biological context within which the structure was working. And we had some success. This is from a recent paper from two of the folks who I was fortunate enough to have working for me, Joanna and Elin, who the majority of these structures are stuff that came from our lab. I'm not going to have time to discuss the details of all of these, or why you should care, or what all of the nuances of all of them are. But because I was thinking about dynamics, and where dynamics has some impact in function, I'm going to look at two sets. One is this UVR-A2 protein up here, which is huge. We're talking 15,000 atoms or so, coordinated action. And the second is this family here, RecR and RecOR. So these are related to this nucleotide excision repair and this non-homologous end join. So dealing with double-stranded breaks and getting rid of huge chunks out of the, the, um, the DNA. These are all parts of complex pathways where there's an interplay between all of the different proteins, and we've got to worry a little bit about that. So, your DNA is scanned by complexes of proteins, one of which is UVRA and UVRB. If it detects something wrong with your DNA, then it initiates a set of chemical and biochemical processes which lead ultimately to the problem being cured. What we were looking at was how does this protein UVRA scan along the DNA and how might it recognize a problem in the DNA? How does it interact with UVRB and what happens down the line? I don't have time to talk about all of that. I'm just going to show you that I, we were able to solve a structure of UVRA which is a dimer, so there are two molecules joined together, the blue and the gold, which have a form like this. So there's a, this top bit, which contains all of the engines for inducing uh, the motor, and these bits which dangle down in my drawing here, which contain a motif which is often found in proteins which, which scan DNA and can tell about what's happening to charge on DNA. From the structure and from some other mo models and some other tests we did, we were able to make a model of where DNA would bind and how the interaction may occur. Try as we might, we could not get a crystal which had the protein in bound to DNA. That was left to somebody else to do. And not long after we published these structures, um, that indeed happened. Um, what I'm showing you is probably about six years' work in three slides. So I'm going to gloss over a lot of detail. But for the purposes of what I'm thinking about today, so we discovered the nucleotide binding domains. We discovered how energy could be generated. We could discover my thing was supposed to loop. 
some ideas about scanning. And this domain that has the DNA recognition element within a crystal, we found in several different conformations. If we aligned all of the conformations, what we found was that the engine, for want of a better phrase, was very static. It seemed to be well, structurally well um, conserved and which stayed in one place. But this domain with the DNA scanning was all over the place. And let me see if my movie, for what it's worth, will run again. Oh, gosh, never let a scientist in charge of it. Um, so by looking between these different um, structures, we came up with a model whereby these arms would be able to wrap around the double-stranded DNA and sort of ratchet along the DNA itself as it goes along. It's probing the DNA to see where there is, a, to see that everything's okay. If it finds that there's a problem, it stops. If it stops, that introduces a, a blockage, you know, in, in other mechanisms, and the DNA repair complex can be formed. Now, we back this up with a, a, a good number of different experiments. What interested me and what I haven't been able to do is actually make snapshots of all of these different states in action. One of the things I hope we would be able to, we will be able to do thanks to the light source and to some of the levels of automation we're going to build in is actually turn the problem of getting one structure into an opportunity to collect a thousand structures and analyze those thousand structures with other data to actually understand this dynamics better. And a better way of showing you some of these op opportunities is in this other type of um, repair, which is path through this pathway, which deals with a double-stranded break. Now, a double-stranded break in DNA is really serious and quite important. And it's, if you think about it, if a double-stranded break doesn't give you any template to, um, to repair against. Because how do you know if the, if the break is this big or this big or somewhere in between? How can a, a molecule tell? And the way in which it tells, whoops, it's really very clever. What it, zoot, excuse me, Annie, shouldn't say zoot, uh, is it processes this double-stranded blunt end so it has overhangs. And then it gets, it recruits a strand which is similar and aligns the two so that the bits here and here match within this strand. And now it knows which bit has gone and how to map it together. Yeah? And, that's what, and that is done through a complex which is, which is involved with proteins called RecO, RecR, and RecF. They recognize this shape in the DNA, so the double strand, single strand break. They can hold a complex stable until other molecules intervene to actually allow for some swapping and some repair to happen between double strand breaks. And this has to happen quickly, and it has to happen non-disruptively, and it has to happen accurately. And so the question we were asking ourselves is, how, does, how do these com compounds fit together? How do the molecules play nice together? And how do they actually interact with the DNA? And the first element of this was to solve the protein, the structure of the protein RecO. So this is one member of this party, and it has, this structure has zinc. Zinc was important because we could use the scattering from the zinc as a way of uh, producing the structure. We have an OB barrel domain. So this type of shape is, is seen a lot in proteins which interact with other proteins, interact with DNA. So that gave us some clues. This was published in 2005. We actually solved the structure in about 2003, the border 2003, 2004. You'll see the last paper we published on this is at the end of 2013. So it's going to be 10 years work this time in about five slides. Um, so that's one of the proteins. So our initial guess was perhaps this end is responsible for binding to DNA. Perhaps this end is responsible for interacting with other things. Around about the same time, a group from Korea solved the structure of RecR, and that turned out to be a tetramer and a circle. But it was something a little bit strange, I suppose, about the crystal structure and a lesson why you shouldn't always um, 
take crystal structures on face value. And the thing that was a little bit funny was that the rings were interlocking like this, like the links of a chain or something like this, which made no sense biochemically, it made no sense for it, its function, on which we guessed was an artifact of the crystallization and of making the, the crystals. And in fact, we solved the structure ourselves independently, came to the same conclusion. But we said, okay, can we solve the structure of the complex? And we did. We got lucky, we produced a structure at low resolution, which we published in 2007. This is an example where if we'd had today's cryo-electron microscopes, we would have gone straight to cryo-EM, because this was an absolute pig to produce, <laughs> to do reliably. You know, it, it was a week or two weeks' work to just generate some protein to do some experiments with. We were able to identify lots of this. We identified um, how the RECO, which is blue, interacts with RECAR. But we had a problem. And that, the problem was that when we looked at these, how these two fit with respect to this hole, we couldn't figure out how the single-stranded DNA would go through. And so the question was, does, would a DNA go through here, or would it be wrapped around the side somehow? And so we started to look at different things and to bring in different techniques we could use at the light source. And one of these was a solution-based approach, a scattering experiment, where we're looking at the lower resolution structure of the elements, of, of the elements of our complex. And what we saw surprised us a little bit in that in solution, our REC R protein, which is a tetramer in the crystals, is a dimer, or appears to be a dimer. And then if you think about um, a tetramer, there are two ways of making a dimer out of a tetramer. Two, there are many ways, but there are two easy ways given our structure. One is you split it vertically down the middle, or you split it horizontally down the middle. And that was sort of important because the energy to do, make those two changes was different. So, oh, this is so sensitive. I can't wave my arms around and not move the slide. Um, so we were able to determine there was a dimer. So then the next question is, where does the DNA go? And to do that, we took advantage of opportunities on the site at Grenoble to do neutron scattering. And neutron scattering has the lovely property that if you mix heavy water with light water, you can effectively match out some of the components of your, that you're looking at the scattering from, so they become invisible in the pattern, for want of a better word. And that's what these um, curves are supposed to show. They're offset a little bit, just so that you can see that they are a little bit different. And taking all of this data together and merging it with our X-ray and crystallography data, we were able to show that single-stranded DNA would pass through the hole. And that makes sense in terms of uh, this molecule assembling around a junction between double-stranded and single-stranded DNA and maintaining a location, if you like, a lock on the transition point itself. And we had other evidence that this was probably right, which I don't have time to go into, but... So, this was our original form, the low resolution bit where we had to convince ourselves DNA could get through. This, the blue, so the blue is our RECO, the circle is our RECR. In the more open form, there's loads of space for this single-stranded DNA to go through, and we were able to demonstrate this at lower resolution using um, small angle scattering. Today, and one of the reasons why another push we're thinking about here at Brookhaven is to introduce cryo-electron microscopy is by combina the combination of these techniques plus cryo-EM, we would have unambiguous, detailed understanding and models for the dynamics of these biological questions in action. So, one question at the end of this. We, we looked on a lot of things. What makes... Dinococcus radiation, uh, radio durans, so resistant to radiation. Well, unfortunately, this is science, so the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> There's lots more work to do. The best guess, I think, at the moment, is that the survival and the repair is probably due to this 
highly efficient um, DNA repair mechanisms and the ensemble of enzymes that do this, some of which um, me and my collaborators have been able to cast some light on. There is other work which suggests that the fact that the organism can control free radicals is really important. The role of manganese and ion is really important in this system. But, and this is a sort of a bit of a grouchy statement at the bottom, but one of the problems we had is that Radio Durans was not a standard model organism and is actually quite different to standard model organisms. So anything and everything you try to publish, a question is, well, this goes against the standard model. And one thing I think as scientists, especially working in biology, we have to be very aware of is not getting too wrapped up in the dogma of standard model systems because the standard model systems may not be representative of the rest of life that we're trying to understand. Yeah. So, this was our hobby. My group's real primary goal was that we supported science at the light source in Grenoble. So how did we do all of this scientific research? Partially it was due to the, the way in which the SRF is funded. Mostly it was because the, the Partnership for Structural Biology was established, which is a grouping of those institutes that were interested in structural biology. We got together to actually share resources and experience and actually generate more by, through cooperation than we would have done individually. So the light source you've seen, the Isère and the Drac are the two rivers I mentioned earlier. This is taken from somewhere on top of the mountain near where I used to live. But we have the highest flux neutron source in Europe on our doorstep. We have the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, which is just about here, where I worked originally, a center of excellence for the types of work that um, I've been talking about. We have a French institute over here. All of these combined together to produce this, this virtual institute, if you like, which has a real home. The home is this building here where we were able to finance, fund, and operate facilities for scientists working at the light source to actually do science and actually have a ruddy career afterwards, which to me is one of the most important things we achieved whilst we were there because so many of the people I was fortunate enough to work with have been able to go on from the light source work to establish their own groups and to actually be successful in their own right and follow the course that they wanted to follow and not be feel trapped in a single role. And I think this is an important issue for us here at the light source. So an SLS2 will be transformative. It will be, but being brightest in many senses is going to be the most important um, element of this. So, the old brightness problem. A big source, it's divergent, you end up with a big x-ray beam that you want to shine on your crystals to do all of these experiments. Of course, if your crystals are tiny, your experiment is now 10 crystals all at the same time and you probably can't do anything with them. The new problem, and the problem we're, we're currently struggling with very much is where my green laser is, is where the beams we will be producing now are. So we will make experiments possible which were previously impossible. That's the technology. The science is gonna be, and the challenge for the science, the opportunity for the science, is actually do something useful with this. One example is that where before I had one experiment, now I've got several hundred experiments several hundred different structures potentially I can investigate. How to do this? I honestly don't know. I really don't. I have ideas. Other people have ideas. We're working hard to try to figure out all that needs to be done. But it's by the deployment of small beams like my laser on small crystals and actually thinking in different ways about what the technology is enabling us that's going to give us new science in the end. Now, why am I confident about this? NSLS2 will be the brightest source of x-rays for this 
sort of experiment for some time to come. The beam lines we are building, which is this purple one, this purple one, and this purple one, the beam lines we're building for structural biology, will be ahead of the competition. So these are all the different, uh, different light sources around the world, and I've gone through and looked at the performance of these different beam lines and plotted them on this graph. And in many cases, the, the principle I'm working towards is that that way, so smaller, and that way, more intensity, is better. And you can see NSLS2 should be transformative and should be enabling new science simply because our beam lines will be. Where's the, I have to search on this now. Um, that is the next best beam line in the United States. And that ought to be worrying for many people, but we'll leave that question aside for the moment. That's the next best in the United States, probably. So we've got an order of magnitude or more in size and approaching three orders of magnitude more in brightness. We need more crystallography beam lines at NSLS too, because Europe is moving away. So some of the ideas to use this light source. So this is um, a long-term collaboration that's gone on from PXRR days and includes a lot of the team that you know from um, NSLS. Through various iterations, this is actually working at the um, LCLS, the X-ray free electron laser. If you have your crystals in a suspension and you use sound to gently blow these things out of solution and have a conveyor belt that's traveling fast enough and accurately enough. You can put little blobs with crystals on. You can use lasers to induce different structural changes. You could add different chemicals if you wanted to look at fast uh, kinetics. And by timing it just right with the, the X-ray pulse, you get a diffraction pattern. So you get one pattern per crystal, so you're gonna need thousands upon thousands of crystals. This is transferable to NSLS2. It may op offer new opportunities for us. But I talked about, with thinking about the atomic scale through to the cellular scale, and here's, here's a different opportunity. Together with um, the biology department, and particularly Chun Lu, we're looking at taking these blobs, which are supposedly proteins, and making atomistic models of them. This is an extraordinary, di oop, extraordinarily difficult still, but we're making progress. To put that into a context of what happens in a real cellular membrane where there are dynamics in action, where the proteins themselves are arranged and rearranged will take different, um, different uses. And this is, this is where the physics and the, the ideas that are available at NSLS2 come to our aid because there are techniques which will allow us to look at the relatively slow dynamics and the faster dynamics. And so in the last week or so, we've been talking with... Uh, Yonkai and with Misha to actually say, well, you know, is there some way we can actually apply this range of techniques to real biological systems? And I think this is a tremendously exciting opportunity to bring together multiple different types of science on biological problems. Again, I think it's really important that science is the driver and not technology for the sake of technology. This is going to need difficult teams, but I think if we're going to do some of these things, we're going to need intense beam lines check, I think we've done that. We're going to lead, need high levels of automation. We're trying to do that, and I think we're going to succeed in the near future. We need to figure out how to deliver the sample so we can do the experiment we want. Tick, I think we've got brains and imagination. We're going to need to bring together multidisciplinary approaches. We realize this. It's really tough. We've worked through this. It's going to need to bring together teams of scientists with very different backgrounds and with computational scientists to merge all these different sources of information together so that we can understand the dynamics of biological systems in, in action. It's feasible, it's doable, it should be done here in my opinion. So, you'll be glad to know I'm nearly finished. I'm a great believer that teams are the way in which you need to address science. Individuals are brilliant. 
teams endure and teams get more done faster. I've been extremely lucky to have worked with some very good teams, especially the, the structural biology group we set up at the SRF in the past. I'm not, please don't be offended by me talking about the past and the science I've done there. Um, in particular, I was really lucky to work with Joanna, Ellen, Elspeth, Celia, Inga, Jens, Gordon, who all made huge contributions to the, the scientific work I've shown you in the middle part of this talk. None of it would have got done if we'd been sat on our own in the light source. And the Partnership for Structural Biology really transformed what was possible for us on that facility, in that environment in Grenoble, and we'll continue to do so. And of course, we are, and we're going to continue to be thankful to all the NSLS2 teams, and I should have said the BNL teams, who are going to help us support generating the best structural biology center at a light source. Not on Long Island, not in the Northeast, in the world. It's going to take a long time and a lot of work, but we will be able to do it. And with that, you will be glad to know I'm done. I thank you for your attention, and if you have questions, I'm more than willing to answer them. First part of your question, I'm sorry. Yes. You said they bind single strand. Yeah. DNA molecule. Are they the same DNA binding protein, single binding protein that we see when DNA is replicated in nanocells? Um, no, they're different proteins. They do actually interact with, with those proteins because there's an in, entire set of processes that occur in order to recognize this, um, this type of damage, and I just zoomed down into one area. But the, the proteins I'm showing you, the family of proteins, are quite general within bacterial organisms, and the processes we're describing are quite general in the context and not restricted to just the, the organism in which we, we happen to be working. So. Um, that's a good question and um, an easy one and a hard one to answer. One of the problems for crystallography is you need a crystal. Yeah, that's evident. Forming a crystal can take a lot of time, a lot of postdocs, a lot of money, and sometimes you never arrive. The promise of modern cryo-EM is that you can use relatively small amounts of, of protein material and be able to resolve a structure at the same level of detail or approaching the same level of detail as you can with crystallography. If the protein, is, if the protein or protein complex is big enough and if you can get access to the microscopes. Access to the microscopes is going to be a challenge, which is why we're pushing to try to have a facility here which we can run as a user facility. Hello, Jean. Um, have you ever been to the sales? Black Friday. Everybody's at the door and you've got a direction you want to go to and it's elbows out and everybody fight everybody to get there. Yeah? The, the cell is very crowded in terms of the proteins that are there so that it's a really difficult problem which I think is driven by chemical effects and by signaling effects and by a greater organization within the um, cell that I don't understand well enough to give you a sensible answer to. Sorry.
Thank you all.